Now, the, um, let me uh, first introduce the uh, Professor Michael um, McMahon. Um, Professor McMahon is uh, from uh, the uh, University of Oxford. He also worked uh, previously at a number of the university, including Warwick, um, uh, INSET, NYU, Chicago, ILBS, RSE. I wonder, there, are there any other university you never work, maybe including uh, University of Tokyo? Um, Michael also um, worked at the uh, Bank of England for many years. And he's uh, currently a research fellow of the CEPR and the director of the Research uh, Policy Network on Central Bank Communications. So communications, communications. Now we find the right person. Michael's interest, of course, uh, not only lies in uh, with communications, but also a wide variety of the economic field, including Macroeconomics of physical policies, um, business cycles, uh, monetary economics, inventories, and applied uh, econometrics. And um, uh, of course, after and and he published uh, uh, Michael uh, the, published a, a, a large number of the volumes of the papers, uh, and including some of the leading uh, journals like Quarterly Journal of Economics. Uh, RES, JME, um, the uh, Review of Economics and Statistics, and Journal of International Economics, and other uh, academic journals. So after Michael's presentations, uh, Professor, Professor uh, uh, Motozuku um, Shintani will uh, provide a comment as a discussant. So without further ado, let me give the floor to Michael. So Professor Macom, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you to the organizers uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's a really very appropriate conference for me. This paper is one of a number of papers that come from a uh, European Research Council grant that's actually entitled New Data, New Methods, New and Old Questions. So this uh, seems um, particularly appropriate. Um, before I get into the sort of the, the detail of the academic paper, which is joint with Anna Cislak, who's at Duke, Stephen Hansen, who's at UCL, and Song Zhao, who's a PhD student in finance at LSE, uh, let me say two things. One, I will state that uh, I am a member of Ireland's Fiscal Advisory Council, uh, so the usual disclaimer applies, but since it's Chatham House rules, I should be okay. This has nothing to do with fiscal anyway. Um, and the second is to sort of summarize a little bit the, the bigger picture policy takeaway that I have from this. And it's actually, I think, quite related to what Athanasius was telling us about earlier. Um, and so I, I sort of view this paper, it was sort of motivated by the fact that really monetary policy is always shrouded in huge amounts of uncertainty um, across many different dimensions. But thinking empirically in a kind of positive empirical contribution sense, of how do policymakers react to uncertainty or what types of uncertainties do they react to. Uh, we, we didn't really see much in the literature and that's sort of where this, this paper comes. And my takeaway is sort of twofold. One is related to an importance of credibility and the second is related to uh, time varying movements in tail risks that you have to be kind of on top of and thinking about and moving for. But I'll, I'll try and convince you of that by the end. Um, let me get straight into the actual paper. Um, so, so there's the famous Alan Greenspan quote about uncertainty not just being a pervasive feature of monetary policy landscape, but the defining characteristic of that landscape. Um, you know, Bernanke talking about pervasive uncertainty and the need to be humble about ability to forecast and manage the course of the economy. And actually more recently, there's been huge interest in the effects of uncertainty on the economy and even more recently on the effects of policy uncertainty on the economy. Now, the difference in this paper is a lot of the existing work. So if you think about some of the work that Nick Bloom has done, it's uncertainty by member, by agents in the economy about what policy will do. This is going to be a paper that's really about asking when policymakers themselves are uncertain, how does it affect how they behave or does it? And they're sort of an open question. 
So yeah, there's the question, how, if at all, does uncertainty that policymakers perceive affect their decision making? Now, some of you will have immediately thought that this question was answered years ago by Brainard, and the answer was that with higher uncertainty, you just take a more gradual approach. Well, actually, there are many models of different types of uncertainties, Brainard uncertainty being a very particular type of instrument uncertainty. And actually, you can get gradualism, aggression, conservative, you can get a whole host of different types of predictions from different models. So one, one, in, in the face of that, an obvious question is, well, can we just think about empirically what is the reaction to different types of uncertainty? And the answer is it's sort of, well, uncertainty of policymakers is generally hard to measure uh, this sort of latent variable. So we're going to make an attempt at the latter and, and therefore try and get some predictions on, on the former about what the, the behavior is. This is the ultimately the kind of key table in the paper. So I'm going to show it to you up front. You're going to have to trust me on measures, though I will tell you what they are. And then later on, I will try and convince you that they're reasonable. Along the side here, there are three things with PMU after them. PMU standing for policymakers uncertainty. So this will be using the Federal Open Market Committee's transcript. So this is their deliberations of the policy choice that get made available five years later, slightly more than five years. Uh, and after the December of five years has passed, they release them all, including the January one. So it's not like every couple of weeks we get uh, a new release from five years earlier. So this is a measure of inflation uncertainty, economic uncertainty, and market uncertainty. And then we can also measure from the deliberations sentiment about inflation, economic, and markets. These would be, you know, directional measures. You can also include things like controls from the Green Book, which are the staff forecasts for that particular meeting. You can include measures of external uncertainty, like things like Baker, Bloom and Davis measures. And then there'll be a bunch of other things that you can throw in. The key result is this first line, the most consistent and strong predictor of policy stance measure is inflation uncertainty. In column two, you'll see that there does seem to be an effect of when they're more uncertain about, or they express more uncertainty about the economic situation, output, etc. they would tend to lower rates or take a more dovish stance, whereas inflation tends to lead to a more hawkish stance. Actually, the, the sort of the economic effect can be driven out, at least statistically, when you include green book controls and other measures of uncertainty. So policymakers are uncertain about the state of the economy often in much the same ways that everybody else is, including markets, including survey participants, etc. What you do not drive out is the hawkish reaction to uncertainty about the inflation outlook. So that's going to be the sort of key takeaway. How do we get there? Well, the measurement of PMU and sentiment are two of the contributions. So in the ERC title, one of the things is new data and new methods. This is part of a long line of research I have using broadly defined text analysis, natural language processing techniques to try and measure things. Actually, of all of the papers, this is the most simple. What I'm going to do today is incredibly transparent and simple. There are very complicated ways of doing the same things. So if you think ChatGPT with 800 billion parameters is at one end of the scale, today is really at the other almost entry level natural language processing. But I'm going to try and convince you that we pick up the right things with these measures. And then, as I said, we're going to also measure policymakers stance in a similar way using text. And we're going to show that at least the, 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 the behavior of the Federal Open Market Committee is consistent with a world where you worry a lot about tail risk and that tail risk we will link both in terms of a little model and also in terms of some narrative evidence to concerns about inflation fighting credibility. Now, one reason why I think this is a particularly interesting and pertinent thing to talk about now is that one, the Federal Reserve had then in the sample we're looking at, which will run from the start of Alan Greenspan's tenure until 2016, had a dual mandate, still does have a dual mandate. Moreover, the Fed would not be the first central bank you would think of as worrying a lot about their credibility. You, you know, over a lot of that period, the Fed had largely been one of the most credible central banks, if not the most credible bank, central banks in the world. I still remember when I was a university student, The Economist 
headline that had Alan Greenspan portrayed as a Jedi Knight saving the world from evil. Um, and yet what's really clear from the analysis of the transcripts is in spite of that, that credibility was earned through worrying about losing it, which I think is a, a, an important lesson uh, when thinking about where we are now and, and the need to signal our determination to do what we do best as central bankers, and that's fight inflation. Anyway, let me uh, jump into this. I'm going to go very quickly just in the interest of time. We, we lay out a very simple model because one thing that's true in most of the monetary models that we use for the analysis of economic phenomenon in central banks have a property which is uncertainty doesn't actually matter. So you can see that pretty clearly if you take a very standard loss function in inflation and output gaps. And you have, you know, very general, there's some distribution of inflation that depends on the choice of interest rate. So interest rate can move the sort of the central measure of that distribution around. And in, it does so linearly to make it simple, but it can also move the, the, the variance of that distribution around. Having interest rates affect the mean of inflation and output would be quite standard in our models. Having it, the interest rate, the real interest rate affect the variances is much less common. If you derive the optimal policy, you see you get something, this is in continuous time, and I apologize to our discussant because I, we have adapted this part of the model to make it try to be a bit more direct and quick. So he had to read through more pages of model than uh, will be in the new paper. Um, but you see there are these terms that, that, that include essentially in the burden of proof for changing rates, a measure that depends on how the change in rates will affect the variance. So actually it's very easy in this world to get certainty equivalence that's the property of most of our models. If your interest rate does not affect the variances, we live in a certainty equivalent world. When you have a lot of uncertainty, it's still just the expected values that you use to assess the optimal policy choice. Another way you could think about this, which is closer to the sort of Nick Bloom type of work, and many others, of course, before and after, is this idea that, you know, uncertainty, when the world is uncertain, it's like a negative demand shock. So you can think about something which the variance of output conditional on R has this term which depends on R, but also this shifter term, and also that that shifter lowers economic output. That's uh, higher uncertainty is like a negative demand shock. Now, in that world, you do get a reaction of policy to uncertainty, but you only get it because it shifts the average. So higher uncertainty, like a negative demand shock, you want to offset that, but you don't get any additional effect of uncertainty on policy. In order to get that additional effect, there has to be at least, so we call it Fed-driven uncertainty here, you can think about it as policy-driven uncertainty. Essentially, you need some effect of your uncertainty on the amount of variation you're going to see in output or inflation distributions. So for example, if you think that having a tighter policy makes uh, future inflation less widely distributed, you would get an effect uh, on your optimal choice of policy from time variation in uncertainty. Okay, that's just to sort of frame, frame the idea. I will come back to that model a little bit at the end. A big chunk of this paper is, is the sort of textual measures. Uh, I'm going to be very brief on them. We have the sections of the Federal Open Market Committee transcripts, so we split them into the sections that discuss the current state of the economy and the bit that discusses the policy choice. There's a whole bunch of other bits. They are not part of this, so if, if people later on discuss you know, uncertainty about some special topic that's being discussed or something else that's not included in here, we, of course, a nice thing about these is we can do these measures at speaker level, and I will show you some speaker level results. Uh, as I said, we go up until 26, we have 227 uh, meetings. This is Greenspan up until uh, we stop the data collection. We can add another year now and we'll be able to add another one sh shortly. And as I said, we have the controls for the Green Book, Teal Book, actual staff forecasts. And what we basically do is we try to construct these measures uh, ab about policymakers' uncertainty and policymakers' belief. We're going to create these uncertainty PMU indices using a word embeddings approach. This is 
as I said, a fairly entry level NLP technique. It's corpus specific. So within the transcripts, we put the word risk in and it tells us which words in that, in that, in that corpus are semantically most similar to the word risk. Similarly, we do it with uncertainty. And again, there are lots of interesting questions about whether risk and uncertainty are separate concepts. It turns out in policy discussions, and there's a Greenspan quote on this somewhere, um, they tend to be used interchangeably, even if, of course, in a sort of um, probabilistic versus uncertainties, uh, night in uncertainty type world, we might like to think of them as differently. They're very highly correlated. Um, in terms of policy stance, broadly speaking, we come up with a bunch of ways of identifying when someone is pushing towards tightening the stance or loosening the stance. Obviously, at the zero lower bound, we have to yeah, deal with changes in the policy instrument like the asset purchases, etc. But we come up with measures and I'll show you them. Okay, so here's an example of the embeddings approach. So the most similar word to risk in the FOMC transcripts is the word risks. Then there is the uh, bigram, downside risk, then threat, upside risk, danger, probability, possibility, likelihood, etc. And similarly on uncertainty, there's uncertainties, anxiety, angst, skepticism, tension. Now, again, we did, I, I think it will just end up as an appendix now in the paper, but we did have a section that really tried to look at the differences between them. I was slightly impressed by how much risk words looked like those associated with probabilities and uncertainties are sort of have a slightly more unknown element to them, at least as descriptive terms. But this is what, what we measure. We then allocate those to topics about inflation, the economy, or markets. There are many ways that you can identify them, topic models, dictionaries. These are done off a dictionary approach, but these are the words that, so essentially if a sentence has the word inflation or inflation expectations in it, and then they say, I'm uncertain or there's uncertainty, then we will attribute that as a score to the inflation PMU measure. Similarly, economy and markets. And this is what we get. The red lines are smoothed. The actual underlying indices are quite noisy, but you can see over the time that these things move around. Um, un uncertainty tended to go up a lot on the economy as we entered recessions, although less so at the beginning of the 90s. Market uncertainty, as you might expect, uh, shot up uh, as we entered the financial crisis. Um, one thing that I found very striking about these is that they are not as highly correlated as you might think. So inflation and, and economic PMU are uh, about 0.1 correlated, uh, the correlation coefficient. So it's not the case that these things move perfectly together at all. Um, in fact, the two that are most correlated are the economy and markets, which have a 0.4 correlation. Um, there are 16% of other uncertainty mentions that don't appear in, in, as inflation, economy, or markets, but I'll come back to those a little bit later. So one, one worry that people naturally have is that what you're picking up is uh, when uh, someone around the table says, I'm worried about inflation, or I'm very uncertain about inflation, what they're really saying is, I think inflation will be worse or better than uh, what's currently in the forecast. Well, so I try to assuage those concerns. Here's a regression over multiple horizons. Each horizon we're using the Green Book Nowcast and to show that inflation PMU at time T does not predict any future changes in the Nowcast from the, from the Fed staff. So at least as far as, uh, as, as that direct you know, correlation, it's not there. Similarly, for the economy picking up growth forecasts periods out. How do they relate to these other measures of uncertainty? Things like Baker, Bloom and Davis, Hustard, Rogers, Sun, or VIX measures, or measures of inflation dispersion from, from, from the um, blue chip or growth dispersion. Well, the striking thing, and again, this sort of starts to point, there is some positive correlation with the economic PMU and say uh, the Baker, Bloom and Davis measure. But what's really striking is, is a very strong negative correlation with inflation uncertainty. And actually, if, if one thing I sort of realized after this is we don't have a lot of measures of inflation uncertainty as, as we do of these other types of uncertainty out there. Okay, 
We also have this measure HD, which uh, not high definition, but uh, Hawk Dove. This is a Hawk Dove index. So as I said, we come up with a bunch of ways of measuring uh, dovish statements and hawkish statements. Unlike the PMU measures, which were measured in the discussion of the economic situation, these are exclusively measured in the discussion of the policy decision. So you can look at each individually. You can see that there are periods, say in the, in the mid-90s and late 90s, when there were both genuine hawkish statements and dovish statements being made on the committee at, at, at a time. You can see there are periods where, for example, right after Lehman Brothers, there are only dovish statements and very few hawkish ones. But then later on, there's sort of more of a balance uh, at, at, at times. If you look at the net measure of these, so this is the one that we will use, the hawk less the dove, this gives us some sort of net position of the committee. And again, you can do this at individual level. So you could look at an individual member's hawk dove stance. You can see you get this, this sort of thing that moves in ways that look approximately right, most dovish around the start of recessions. That's the Asian financial crisis and the LTCM collapse. Um, but then we have sort of over time, they sort of tend to go back towards this stuff. Um, this hawk dove stance does pick up changes in the Fed funds rate, not just within the meeting and not just con after controlling for, the, for, the, uh, for a bunch of the green book controls and, and lags and all the standard things you might put in a reaction function. So it's picking up something beyond just the immediate policy decision. You can see it picks up quite neatly. Uh, you show this in regression as well. These are the Roma Roma shocks. So there's another way of showing the last regression. But you can also see that it picks up changes in the Fed funds rate, going meetings out, even controlling for, for the Green Book. So there's something in this stance measure that's indicative of the direction that the, the, the Fed discussions are taking. And again, I am sorry, this is a discussion-based measure. Okay, so. Now we go to the sort of the, the, the key regression, and this is essentially the one that I, that I showed you um, that I showed you earlier. Uh, let me just add one. This is, this is if you just include the economic PMU measures and some green book controls, but you don't include at all any sort of individual uh, FOMC member controls for their sentiment. So we also measure those because, you know, one reason you could just disagree with the staff forecast. So we, we come up again, I won't go into the measures. You come up with these sentiment measures and you throw them in and you see that those are really highly correlated with the econ PMU and they, those plus the public uncertainty kill that. And then this is the effect that I, I, I spoke to you about on the first slide. So this is the key takeaway, the really strong response that we find of the FOMC. Oh, I'm doing better than I thought, excellent. Um, I was just told I have 10 minutes left. Um, the really strong response is this sort of more hawkish stance in response to uncertainty about inflation. Okay, so, so then the rest of the paper is really about digging into that and showing that it's something meaningful. Okay, so here's one thing. Is it just the staff or is it the, is it the, is it the members? Well, again, we can split out the staff versus the FOMC members and do this separately. You see very strongly that it is the it is the FOMC members themselves that drive this effect and not the staff around the table who are doing it. In fact, you get much higher correlation between staff and FOMC members on the economy. As I said, you did with the external measures of, of uncertainty. Whereas, you know, there are periods where the, the members of the committee become much more concerned about inflation and staff and even the markets are just not expressing that same concern. So there's something going on there and that was sort of what we were digging into. As I said, if you, if you worry that it's all because certain members of the committee just use uncertainty terms a lot, that is true. There are some sort of individual fixed effects that you might wanna worry about. Well, you can do everything I just said with individual fixed effects and you can see that you get the same kind of strong significance on inflation PMU for individuals and not, but if you include an aggregate inflation PMU measure, that kills the individual effect. That is, this is really time variation at the committee level that drives this and not any particular individual members of, or cohort effects. You can think about what this means for policy. So if you want to give a number to this, 
you can see that a one standard deviation increase in uncertainty about inflation, PMU, will give rise to, at about a year ahead, will give rise to about 35 basis points. Now, the period that I was just, uh, I, I'll go back here actually, this period in the early noughties, sort of running up to the financial crisis, this was actually a three standard deviation increase in inflation PMU. So if you did the maths on that, it's somewhere around one to 1 1.25 uh, percentage points uh, on, on, the, uh, on the Fed funds rate from, from that extra uncertainty. So that's the kind of order of magnitude we're talking about. Again, if you worry that this is all small sort of meeting by meeting variation and not, nothing that shows up in the sort of the big picture, this is just a plot, not, not to imply any sort of regression or anything, but just a plot of the Fed funds rate in black. And then this is the PMU, inflation PMU measure. And you certainly see that inflation PMU tends to start going up as they then start in advance of them starting to raise rates and de decrease rates. Okay. So then the, the, the really interesting question, which I'll finish on, is what drives this effect? As I said, a natural reaction is, well, we've all learned about Brainard uncertainty, so they're just they're uncertain about the model. It's, it's got to be that. Well, two things. One, I want to be very clear. Of course, central bankers are not only uncertain about the model, but they're aware they're uncertain about the model. The question is whether it's the time variation in that that's driving policy reaction. And the answer is, well, on one level, they just don't talk about model uncertainty. That could be purely a linguistic feature, but you see this is plotted on the same scale as the earlier PMUs. It barely moves around. And as I said earlier, these things, you would think if you're uncertain about the model, you would be uncertain about inflation and output at the same time because that, that's how our general equilibrium models work. That's not what we find. But equally, you can, you can think about what it means well, why would you find hawkishness in response to uncertainty if it's Brainard uncertainty, which predicts not hawkishness nor dovishness. What Brainard predicts is a greater region of inactivity. It predicts gradualism. It predicts a, a lack of action. Well, you might say if, you're, if, you're, um, if your sample is skewed toward times when you should have been cutting, then gradualism is not cutting, which will look more hawkish. Well, actually, you can split this into regimes. So these are regimes when they've just taken in the last six, uh, sorry, in the last 12 months, they've taken a cut decision, a hike decision, or they haven't taken any decision. You can see the effect is tending to be, is entirely driven in periods when the Fed has been inactive in, uh, in policy moves for a while. Similarly, you can define it by the blue book measures of whether the, the alternative is for, uh, no change as the alt b statement for those of you who know this so again doesn't look like it's it's a pure brainard type channel so instead the rest of it is to do the obvious thing and ask policy makers themselves how they think about policy and this is where you get a lot of the discussion about you know risk management types approaches uh, and being very aware of needing to be credible keep uh, inflation expectations anchored we saw Jay Powell's discussion at Jackson Hole where, you know, having perhaps been slow to, to, to move, this was a, a clear statement of intent of what, what we're trying to do here. And there is, you know, Athanasius' earlier work with John Williams and others who've talked about this work on inflation scares. This looks very much like that. You can write down a model where there's no effect of, uncert of policy on uncertainty, but there is an effect of, uncert of policy on tail risks. So on the probability of an event occurring, which is say a, 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 an adverse inflation surprise, I won't talk you through everything, but you can kind of show that you get the effect. You can look at this and you see that there is this asymmetry when they're uncertain about inflation, even around the financial crisis, even after we've hit the zero lower bound, the inflation uncertainty tends to be more skewed toward inflation going up rather than inflation going down. So directionally, it also fits with the tail risk story. And then recently I had uh, uh, Stefano Giuseppe as a discussant and he, he took his model of uh, long-term anchored inflation expectations, structurally estimated, but it gives a distribution. And if you work at an asymmetry measure from that distribution, which is the blue dash, which you could think of as a long-term you know, tail risk type measure, 
you can see I was surprised it actually doesn't fit too badly with black, which is our inflation PMU, even though the other measures of market based uh, measures of uncertainty don't sort of move as much as our measure. There's a, then a bunch of evidence in the paper with quotes from the transcripts themselves. Let me just give you one or two from Janet Yellen. Uh, a failure to shift policy just modestly in response to shifting inflation risks could undermine the assumptions on which the market's own stabilization res stabilizing responses are based. This is November 2005. So with respect to policy, I support at a minimum the removal of any remaining policy accommodation. So a few more increases, including one today, seem to me likely to be required because inflation is at the upper end of my comfort zone. And then in 2014, there is a sort of symmetry to this. This is when inflation was a bit low. As President Kochilakota emphasized, a failure on our part to take decisive action could exacerbate this risk by diminishing the credibility of our commitment to our 2% inflation objective. Okay, I'll skip that. Let me leave it here. As I said, this is a sort of positive empirical contribution. We were interested in how policy should or if it should respond to uncertainty. And in trying to measure it, we uncover the Fed, a very credible central bank, seems to have worried about their credibility. It's worried about inflation and in response to greater worries about inflation, particularly upper skews to that, that, that distribution of inflation, the Fed has tended to adopt a hawkish stance, both sometimes with action, but also with words. There's a, there's a follow-up related question that Anna and I are working on, which is now mapping this to external communication and seeing what it does to uh, to risk premium, but I will leave that for the discussion. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, indeed, um, sir, uncertainties, model, credibilities, uh, trade-off, uh, very uh, thoughts are uh, stimulating. Now let's um, hear from um, Professor uh, Shintani uh, as a discussion, please. Okay, I thank for the opportunity to discuss this interesting paper uh, by Professor McMahon and his co-authors. Uh, the main objective of the paper is to evaluate the effect of policy makers' perception about uncertainty uh, on their policy decision making. Uh, to do so, this paper utilizes the text information from FOMC transcripts and proposes two new measures related to the monetary policy. The first measure is about uncertainty faced by FOMC uh, members, which they call PMU measure. And the second measure is on policy stance, which they call folk doll or HD scores. Uh, to be more specific, they use all transcripts of 228 FOMC meetings between 1987 and 2015. Then by estimating World embedding model, uh, they identify 78 words closely related to the risk and uncertainty. They combine these words with topic specific keywords and use time frequency to construct four topic specific uh, PMUs, and they are inflation PMUs and real economy PMU, and financial market PMU, and the model PMU. They also construct the PMUs uh, for individual FOMC members and Fed staff economists. And HD score is Hawk score minus Dove score where each score corresponds to time count of pre-selected pre uh, keywords. And these are main findings. Uh, by running 
regression of HD on PMUs, the paper finds that inflation PMU is significant and is the most important determinant of policy stance. And HD is also influenced by real economy sentiment. In contrast, effect of model uncertainty seems uh, negligible, and the proposed PMU measures uh, differs. Uh, the paper claims that the proposed PMU measures differs from existing uh, measure of macroeconomic uncertainty, such as the one uh, proposed by uh, 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 Brock Bloom Davis uh, or e EPU measure, because the EPU measures uh, are counter cyclical, but the uh, inflation PMU uh, computed in this paper is indeed pro cyclical. And they argue that uh, their inflation PMU is closely associated with tail risk of inflation. And because of increasing popularity of text analysis, a lot of people are now working on FOMC uh, documents, uh, including uh, statements and uh, minutes and uh, uh, transcripts. And this paper uses a traditional uh, method in text analysis, basically word count, but it still provides a lot of new findings which helps us to understand the decision-making process uh, in FOMC. And, and I really enjoy reading this paper and I believe the paper is already in good shape. Uh, so I only have several minor comments to, to make. And, and this is comment number one. It's about uh, model and parameter uncertainty. And there's a well-known work by Bill Brainerd showing that the central bank will be reluctant to change the policy when they face increasing uncertainty about the uh, uh, parameter or the model uncertainty, uh, sometimes called as a Nietzschean uncertainty. And this type of uncertainty is measured as a model PMU in the paper, but the time frequency of the model specific keywords seems uh, too small uh, compared to, to other topic keywords. And this is actually the table which lists model related words and such as parameter and the model and the measurement and the focus errors. And these are terms we often use among uh, uh, macroeconomic researchers uh, and the people, maybe people in this room, but these terms uh, contribute very, very small portion in FOMC transcripts. So, I thought about this model PMU and if there are any way of expanding the list of words related to model uncertainty. And this is because the policy implication of national uncertainty is very important issue for a lot of people working on building macroeconomic models. For example, for me, it seems natural to consider that FOMC members are facing uh, increased model uncertainty whenever they introduce new type of monetary policy, such as QE or large scale asset purchases or for guidance compared to the case when they conduct conventional monetary policy, since how the conventional policy works in the economy uh, should be more predictable to FOMC members. And in the paper, HD measure is indeed constructed by adding new terms for QE preferences after 2009. So uh, I, I wonder if there's any possibility of utilizing information 
on newly appeared policy rules to augment the model uncertainty measure. And that's my first point. And, and the second point is about the classification of topic. And this paper employs topic-specific keywords to compute topic-specific PMU. So everything is transparent and interpretable. And so this approach is very comfortable to economists because there's no black box. But in the previous work by the same author, uh, they used LDA uh, to assign topics on FOMC transcripts at the paragraph level. And nowadays we can use transformer-based models for topic classification, such as BART, or possibly uh, use LLM. LLM, LLM. And unlike uh, back of walls or uh, lexical approach, machine learning methods are generally considered uh, to perform well for the purpose of prediction uh, with the cost of interpretability. And for example, given a sentence on PMU as an input, machine learning can obtain a better probability of changing the policy rate. So, uh, I want to know uh, what is Arthur's view on pros and cons of these two approaches in the context of text analysis or monetary policy. And I guess this is, sounds rather a broad question, but since I myself uh, have been working on macroeconomic application of uh, Japanese text data recently, this issue always comes to my mind. And the third point is about the information uh, we can extract from the text data regarding the distribution of forecast or forecast errors. And in general, sentiment index seems to represent the first moment of forecast. And the typical macroeconomic uncertainty measure such as EPU uh, seem to represent the second moment uh, with a keyword related to uncertainty. However, in this paper, uh, they claim information PMU captures the information on the third moment or, or the skewness. And in particular, inflation PMU turned out to be correlated uh, with a tail risk that are obtained from a distributional asymmetry measure of long-run inflation expectation, and, and, and this is a numerical value. And my question is if there's any guidance on extracting information on the shape of the distribution of forecast uh, from the text data, uh, including uh, higher moments such as uh, third moment or even fourth moment and and some clue uh, might be uh, there in the NLP literature but I'm not familiar uh, with, with, with any of uh, uh, this method and 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 that's that's all I have to say Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Shinkani. And of course, applause for um, Professor McMahon. Um, if you actually finish earlier, <laughs> I think you have uh, five minutes, but yeah. So uh, before I uh, uh, turn uh, the, uh, to the audience for questions, uh, let me ask uh, Michael if you want to have a brief and quick uh, uh, feedback to the, uh, the comments raised by Professor Shintani. Yeah, just to say thank you for the discussion. Um, and yeah, I, I guess three three points um, to make. One reason why we use so few words for the for the model uncertainty is we, we actually had an absolute cutoff in the embeddings model. So there just weren't that many words related to it that we, we could try to dig out some others. But I should say one clarification is 
It's not that policymakers don't say those words. They just don't express any of our uncertainty terms when they say them. So they will talk about, you know, parameter bounds or whatever. They, they don't say, I'm worried about the bounds. And, and that's what, what contributes to the score. Maybe I think we should, we should make that, that clearer. Um, I, yeah, I, I think I, 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 I've, in other papers, I've explored alternatives to brain art. You can think about robust control environments as another way in which uncertainty might matter. Uh, I have to say, I'm just, with, with looking at all these different approaches, both theoretically and empirically, I'm just not convinced that they're the driving forces. I think if we were to think about what the uncertainty should be in our models, I do think uncertainty about assessing the latent state of the world today and the shocks that have hit is the primary one that matters. And that's absent in a lot of our core models. And that, that's potentially uh, an area we should work on. Um, and, and it matters for central bank communication, actually, because in those models, the thing you're meant to communicate is what your policy, only your reaction function and any forward guidance around it. But actually, I think there's a big role to also play for communicating how you assess the economy and if, if the markets think you're doing that in a credible way, th that itself is also beneficial. So th that's something that's coming out of some of the other work with Anna. And um, the second, on, you're absolutely right. You've got the exact right trade-offs. There is a beautiful transparency to some of the more simple methods. Once you go to large language models, and this is not to rain on the chat GPT parade, but we have no idea what's really happening in those. And we have experimented with them, not in this paper, but in other work I'm doing. We use them. I have a paper that will come out fairly shortly as a draft with a data scientist who's working with me, which is a benchmarking paper. These LLMs can be great. And there's two things I think are problematic for research. One is we don't really know in many cases what they were trained on. There, you know, certainly ChatGPT falls into that. There are versions like, um, there's a version called Llama, which you can get the underlying parameters for, and you can run it on your computer. There's a bit more transparency there. But even still, they're difficult models to run, partly used as a researcher, because they have, you have this interface where you have to ask them things. So you have to set up your questions very well. And that's fine. There's nothing inherently wrong with them in that case. But uh, as a researcher, I'm still a little reluctant to sing their praises fully as a tool to solve all of our problems. But we, uh, some of us discussed it at lunch, actually. So they also have this, this property, which is known as hallucination, which is where they see things that are not actually in the text that you give them. And that's, uh, I'm sure there can be hallucination in my measures as well, but I think it's much less documented and much less uh, prevalent. So, so that's a worry. But again, what, one interesting thing in this benchmarking paper that we find is that you can take some quite simple methods and a and use them in the right ways and you can do almost as well as other frontier models like Finbert or other things that are large and cumbersome to work so this stuff you can run on your laptop you know you don't need a, a server so that, that's an advantage but again I'm not here to say they're wrong and this is right it's just I think for your 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 classification of this idea that we can um that we can the transparency is important to economists I do find that certainly when I've stood up with more complicated methods I get a harder time than being able to say, no, I counted that word. That's it. <laughs> That's what goes on. And then lastly, uh, yeah, is there any guidance on extracting information on the shape of the distribution from the text? No, I mean, that's really what the effort here was. It's really hard in the FOMC's case to do, I think, the full exercise that you would want. But um, so Stephen, myself, and a colleague at the Bank of England, Matt Tong, published a paper in the JME a couple of years ago that tried to do this. And the advantage of the Bank of England in this case is we get the distributional numbers. We get the numerical quantification of the distribution in the form of variances and, and, and skews from the inflation report. And you can map that to the description of the world from the inflation report. Now, what we show in that paper is that the words have an effect above and beyond the measured... Um, the measured signals that they're sending in, in, in numbers. But in the FOMC context, at least to outsiders like me, there is no distributional information provided in terms of the uncertainty around the forecast. There are a few observations where we have the individual member observations of these things. So you can get 
cross-sectional distribution and we have some stuff that we've done where we can map our measures to those and they fit well but that's really telling us they fit well the individual level and not that we've picked up the right distribution or right skew so i think it's a challenge but that's sort of what we're trying to do here uh, i will stop at that point thank you thank you michael now the floor is open um all right the uh let me give the floor to President Dave uh, Autique first, and followed by uh, uh, the professors at, 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 well, at, at, thanks, at Thanks for the promotion first. Um, uh, so this is just a question out of curiosity. Have you looked if there's any kind of correlation with your PMU measures and either the old fashioned balance of risk statement that showed up in the post -F FOMC statements or the risk weighting um, information in the summary of economic projections a little bit later in your sample. Um, Athanasius. Um, thank you. It, uh, it's very nice that you're trying to quantify this incredibly difficult uh, uh, concept of uh, uncertainty, measuring it, communicating it and then drawing the next step would be to draw policy implications. So I wanted to make uh, one comment and one question. The comment is that uh, uh, in the presentation, you um, you talk about Brainerd, uh, but in the paper, you also cite uh, uh, the beautiful work by uh, Ulf Soderstrom, who highlighted really the issue that you find in the data. And the issue is uh, the greater uncertainty there is about uh, uh, the uh, structural determinants of inflation in the future. This is inflation dynamics. This is not the noise in the inflation data, that's uncertainty. This is about inflation dynamics. The greater that uncertainty is, uh, uh, the more forceful uh, policy needs to be, which is the hawkishness element you find. And uh, uh, so, so I would, I would, I would if, if I were you, I would be stressing the Soderstrom result more. And the question is the following. Um, that concern uh, in, uh, in Ulf's uh, um, uh, work, but also in work relating to the concerns about disanchoring inflation expectations that you showed with some of the quotes, suggests the major risk is, uh, that, that policymakers are worried about is the risk of disanchoring inflation expectations, as opposed to uh, greater uncertainty of next quarter's inflation. And, and I wonder if you can um, distinguish the two. Uh, is, really, is, the, is the risk really about, you know, quarter ahead uh, 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 variance of inflation, or is the risk more related to uh, uh, one or two years out, uh, or even further, inflation expectations concern? Can you tell those things apart? Thank you both for the uh, two excellent questions. Um, Michael? Oh, okay, uh, so Dave, um, we haven't done anything with the risk weightings, but we have with the balance of risk. Actually, one thing that was in the paper, but is migrating to the next paper, because the next paper is, uh, Anna and I are looking at the sort of effects of this. So this is obviously all internal uh, at, at some basic level, unless it appears in the minutes and the, and, and the statement, this measure is only made available to... to the world after five years. Um, so, so what we had looked at before, and, and now we're looking at in another paper, is how that how this might be communicated and, and the, the different media through which this type of thing can be communicated. So one thing that you can trace is that there are periods where the proposed staff statement, so the alt, even if it's the alt B statement, you can see how that is adjusted in the policy process when PMU is high to exactly emphasize, you know, the balance of risks shifting. So I think there is direct evidence of that. In the other paper with Anna, we actually show that some of this does not then get reflected directly into the even the minutes, but that it does come out through speeches in the intermeeting period. So th there is a way to get this out, and and we show that it has important effects on, on risk premia in the markets, particularly uh, the more hawkish stance signal tends to drive the risk premium down at these times, which is, I think, related a little bit to Athanasius's question. 
I agree at what's probably going on. I, I don't think they're expressing uncertainty about next quarter. Uh, these tend to be uncertainties about the sort of medium run. So that it is actually quite hard to measure the temporal dimension in text. So I have a recent paper where we've developed a measure to do it, but it's not. Um, it's uh, we haven't applied it in this. Um, we could have a look at that, but I think your your intuition is right, and and, and you're right. So I. I I'm a big fan of Wolf's paper, and and it, it's in there. There is there is one issue, which is, um, his is still a his is an aggression result rather than a hawkish result. So if you're uncertain about inflation dynamics and inflation is low, you should be even more dovish. Whereas what we link is that uncertainty has this directional impact. So so it's it's a little bit different, and 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 but but. I, like I say, I think that's a I think it's a super interesting paper. I think it's massively undersighted and underknown, and, and and I've said this to Ulf many times, but it is in the paper. I just didn't emphasize it because everyone always throws brain art at us, so that's why I emphasize brain art here. Thank you, Michael. Now I have uh, Governor uh, Bailey, and followed by uh, Doctor uh, Smith. Governor Bailey. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Michael. Really interesting paper. I I guess two things. I guess. One of the questions that sort of came to mind was when you talk about uh, uncertainty in a model context is whether really what we're, sh what we're finding here is that when you look at the transcripts, that the form of the sort of the FOMC deliberation really isn't, in, is, isn't really a model-based form. Um, and whether that, that's, in a sense, the starting issue, that you can sort of come into looking at the transcripts and think it will be organized like that, and you find it isn't. I mean, I remember being initially surprised looking at them that, you know, for instance, I don't think you can find the Phillips curve referred to in transcripts much at all, actually, I, I think. Uh, the same question looking at that is, is whether you've actually then sort of tried to sort of, in a sense, do, look, look in more sort of detail at breaking the transcripts up into periods, because they do change, over the, the transcripts do change over time. I mean, it's not, it's not just who's, who's the chair. I mean, there's also, obviously, there's a potential break when it becomes clear that they're actually going to be in the public domain um, and, and, and part of your sample quite a bit of your sample predates that and quite a bit of your sample post dates that so it shouldn't be too difficult to do that I would have thought. Thank you. Um, Dr. Smets. Uh, yes my, my, so uh, my question is on um, basically these regime specific results so I, I don't know maybe I have, have missed it but did you also split between low and, and high levels of inflation? At least my experience is that when inflation was low, we were at uh, close to the lower bound. Then, of course, policymakers worried a lot about you know, the deflation. And so in that, and, and, and particularly uh, in, in light of the, the lower bound. And so there, actually, a higher increase in inflation uncertainty may lead to a, a, an easing bias. Um, whereas when inflation is high or around target, then it kind of turned the other way uh, around. So I was wondering whether that's in, in, in the paper or not. Okay, once again, thank you both. Michael? Uh, yeah, thank, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, I, I've also been surprised at times. Of, uh, that's why I did mention whether or not the model could just be linguistic features. I think there are other reasons. I mean, if you genuinely became more uncertain about the model of the economy, it's unusual that that just gets expressed either as economic or inflation and not just, I'm just uncertain about everything. But again, that, that there could be other linguistic or psychological reasons that drive that, but that's the world we're faced with. I'll actually tell you, to save somebody else from having to do it, we, we, we thought that actually this would be a great environment to go back and answer the question about whether the uh, the seventies was a period where they were not reacting enough, this this old age uh, debate about determinacy in, 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 in the reaction function. Actually, when you go into those transcripts, they, the discussion of monetary policy looks nothing like the world in which we, we, we even see the nineties. So there are some regimes. So actually the QJE paper explicitly looks at the, the regime pre and post uh, transparency. And we didn't find any big differences in it here. And so we don't talk about it, but we, we did have a look at it. Um, this, I'm going to jump quickly across now to the, to, to Frank's point about the regime. So we don't have it in the paper, but actually one of the really striking things as well to me was 
most of the context that we look at is relatively low and stable inflation in the US. So maybe this gets more exciting in about five years from now when we can see what happens in, in the sort of modern era. And I can see all the people who've been in the meetings are starting to smile. So now I'm really excited, but that's five years away. Um, what's really striking is even after, say, the ZLB, which is the period where I thought this would really kick in, actually, it doesn't take long for some members of the committee to start to worry about inflation taking off, right? You, you've just put in a whole bunch of these unconventional policies. There's a lot of stimulus gone in. There's still a lot of uncertainty about the state of the world. And for a lot of the, the, the members, this is reflected in a worry that was, was in the public domain as well, that we've sort of set, you know, set in motion a chain of events that would lead to very high inflation. Um, so, so as well, I will say that all of those regressions have controls for the forecast for inflation in them as well. So if you think you can control for it linearly, then that should, should, should assuage some of your concerns. But um, no, we didn't find big, big differences between the levels of, of, of inflation when we looked at it. It was, we were just looking then at these periods when there's inaction for a while versus you've just done some action, whether it's just sort of after you've cut, there's some worry or after you've raised, there's some worry. Thank you, Michael. Um, let's move forward. I have uh, Mr. Bichi followed by uh, Professor Iwada. Ms. Bichi. Thank you very much. I have a very simple question. That is uh, page 28, policy uncertainty and the sentiment, uh, this meeting level. Uh, if we look at the sentiment uh, factors, I, it seems to me the dependent variable reacts more economy sentiment, not to the inflation sentiment. This is contrary to the policy uncertainty. Uh, can you provide uh, any uh, consistent answer? Hold on. Um, yeah, Ms. Vichy, apologize. <laughs> no, no, no problems. So, so I think I have a question which was perhaps related to, to Frank's, which is, um, There are episodes, there have been episodes, I guess there's one major episode in your data, and you'll get another one in five years or so, where uh, the risks to economic activity are all on the downside after the GFC and during the pandemic. And I'm wondering whether, is there any sense in the data that you see whether these tail risks are around economic activity uh, link to decisions around asset purchases? And the reason I ask that is that following the sort of in the early in the early days of the pandemic when markets seemed to be melting apart uh central banks were very proactive in um purchasing assets in affected markets but they kept those measures in place for some time and several of them motivated that by well this is kind of working against preventing the tail risk that this could get far worse and so, like I said, maybe, maybe you have to wait a few more years until that data comes along, but uh, asset purchases and balance sheet measures and uncertainty might um, perhaps go hand in hand. And then the other thing I wanted to say is you were talking about uh, sort of external, external communication and how to communicate sort of risks to the credibility of the inflation target in the central bank. Well, it, it's, in, it's in moments like these, and I think that's the moment that we're seeing at the moment where uh, the central bank needs to be able to communicate the, the first order, uh, the first, the thing of first order importance is securing the credibility of, of the inflation target, and that that's why there are rate hikes. But to do that, and this circles back to I think something that I said this morning, you have to talk straight about the bad news. I think you can't, the central banks can't pretend to say you know the first order important is to hike to to uh, allay this risk. And then not also follow through with, and this may have consequences. Uh, so I think trying to strike the sort of the Goldilocks path of uh, we're doing this to head off risks, but there will be no collateral damage. I think gives sends double signals in terms of um, double messaging in terms of what central banks are trying to achieve. So thank you, thank you both, Michael. Uh, okay, uh, on, on the question, so I think we should just discuss this uh, with, with the diagram in front of us. Uh, I'll say one thing, though, that's helpful. There, there, there's certainly no mechanical link that people worried about. So our PMU measures, essentially, if we, if we found a, a, a 
term that was uncertainty about the economy, we then exclude that sentence from the measures of sentiment. So these are measured sort of with three sentences actually apart. So we try to, we try to ensure they're separate um, about it. Now, it's also, I think, just a, a second point. It is true that, that like most of the discussion is about the economy uh, in, in the FOMC meeting. Um, I don't think I was surprised by that. And, you know, there's a lot more data on the economy. There's a lot more... Uh, complex interactions to try and get your head around. And you want to understand that to understand what might be going on with inflation further down the road. So I don't think I'm particularly surprised about that, but let, let, let's talk at the, co at the next coffee breaker at the dinner about the sort of specifics of that chart. On, on to the point about um, tail risks. So, so I think there are many other papers, not just mine and preceding mine and so i uh, you know the, the work by um stefano giuseppe and uh and and uh, bruce preston and emmanuel monk and others have sort of talked about this you know with this idea that monetary policy particularly near the lower bound can provide an insurance and whether it's asset purchases or low for longer or whatever um if you want if i think about why you know the reaction is often with economic risk is often very sudden. You know, a crisis or a big shock happens, everybody sees it, so the public are aware, the markets are aware, the central bank is aware, and the action is taken, and often it can be quite drastic action, you know, cut rates aggressively. Whereas I think what we're thinking about when we think about inflation risks is, and this is where the regime-specific results of you haven't moved for a while and this is where it starts to build, is, you, you might have had rates slightly lower than you're comfortable with, or you start to worry that the economy is overheating. Now, there's nothing drastic. It, you know, it's rare that inflation, apart from big oil shocks, just suddenly goes overnight from 2 to 6%. You sort of see, you think the economy, the, the labor market looks a little hotter, the wage settlements data, which are noisy, come in a bit better. And that's what we see in the data. It sort of starts to build. So I think the big difference between the inflation and the economic is really about the time horizon over which these things build. Um, and and that's where that's where I actually think the communication can be more powerful because as it's building, you can say we're watching, we're going to raise rates, we're going to nudge them up. We may do twenty five now and just let you know we're still here, we're watching. You know, this is our number one uh, thing. In terms of the external communications, I think there are two different parts of this. One is the communication with the wider public, and one is the communication with markets. With markets, I think they're they're pretty smart. Not always. I'm sure the central bankers in the in the room are a bit upset with calling them always smart. But I think in general, they understand this stuff. They understand risks. They understand distributions. They understand there'll be mistakes. They don't have to punish them completely. But, but there, I think this work and other work convinces me that you really do, as I said earlier, have to convince them of your assessment. If you think inflation will be transitory, like really get out and show them what's convincing you it'll be transitory. And sort of be open and honest about what data is going to come in that's going to change that assessment. Again, I, you know, I, I, this is not a comment on any one central bank, but the, the question raised earlier was, you know, whether central banks did that effectively or whether, you know, they risked, you know, trying to use their credibility uh, and potentially lose it by not convincing the markets of their view. That's, again, not to say that you have to be right all the time. You have to be convincing uh, at the time. With the general public, it's a bit different because they don't understand any of this. Um, so, so I spoke at lunch with some people. So Andy Haldane and I had, had this paper that looked at public communication, but we talked about three E's. One is explanation, one is um, engagement, and the other is education. Now, I'm not sure education, this came up earlier, I'm not sure that's part of the job of the central bank, although most central banks have some wing that tries to convince people of how the economy works. Engagement is really hard because, you know, when inflation is 2% and has been for years and everything's ticking over nicely, do you want to listen to a central bank press conference or watch a central bank video, even the Bank of Jamaica ones, which are incredibly engaging if you haven't watched them? Or do you want to watch like cat videos on, on YouTube? Well, I know what the public, the public vote with their clicks and that's cat videos, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. One way you get them is engaged is by having double digit inflation. But in terms of your jobs, that's not great because you get attention by not doing your job. So this sort of goes back to being ignored might be a, a cost of being successful. 
And so, you know, may maybe we should have enjoyed that a bit more when nobody cared. Um, and then on ex explanation, the one key thing that I've done on, on, on some research is to show that it's not just this, the language you use in terms of the, the complexity of the language, big words, long sentences. It's actually the concepts. The general public don't understand even concepts like output and even concepts like inflation a lot of the time. So how we communicate difficult concepts is, is actually, I think that's more, so what we call conceptual complexity is more important than semantic complexity. But we did do an experiment uh, recently, we haven't finished the paper yet, but where we did an experiment where we showed people basically a central bank that forecasts badly and they punish that, they, they use that information less. They actually use it particularly less if you forecast badly recently. So there's a recency bias in their, in their Bayesian updating sort of weights. So that's a bit concerning. But the upside for everyone in this room who worries about this stuff for their job is that there is actually a way to talk your way out of this. You can communicate, you know, and some of it is what you were saying. There's a kind of mea culpa that, that actually resonates reasonably well with the public. So that's work with Ryan Rolls that I'm happy to share with anyone who wants to. But yeah, I think it's an interesting topic. Thank you. Thank you once again. And uh, of course, the, uh, we run over the time. Uh, let's thank uh, both speakers uh, with another round of the applause.